anybody else? Did I not say hi to anybody? If I missed you, I'm sorry. Okay. So we're going to start with, wait, let me, because I'm going to put us on gallery view. Yes, there I can see all of you. Okay. So you should have something comfortable to sit on. So like for me, I put a blanket like this so that I have a little bit of a lift so that when I'm sitting, I don't have to think about how my, I don't have to keep my back straight because the little lift helps me keep my back straight. So see if you can make sure you're in a comfortable position. And we're going to start with a little breathing exercise. So first, just close the eyes. And if you don't have earphones, maybe you put yourself on mute just in case if I hear other noises around the, the room. So closing the eyes elongating the spine relaxing the facial muscles and just to tell you I'm gonna put you all on mute because I can hear some sounds in the background but if you need to talk when we're doing some questions, then you can just unmute yourself. Okay, so the eyes are closed. The spine is long. Relaxing the jaw. Relaxing around the mouth. Relaxing around the eyes. So that all the facial muscles are relaxed. And starting to bring yourself inwards. Feeling your body from the inside out. Noticing the inner vibrations of the body. Seeing the natural rhythm of the breath. Slowly allowing the vibration of the body to calm. subtle and allowing the mind to settle Bringing your awareness back to your breathing. And you're going to start to control the breath. So first by counting the, the length of the inhale and seeing if you can make the exhale the same length as the inhale. Start 
to apply the soft sound that you can hear the breath. that sound calm the nervous system. Maybe do a contraction with Ujjayi to help regulate the inhales and the exhales. You can make them a little bit longer and still trying to keep them the same length. few more breaths at your own breathing rhythm. Noticing the body that moves with the inhale and moves with the exhale. do a simple pranayama technique from the Karagidam tradition. It's called Ujjayi, but it's a little different than the Ujjayi we use for our practice, for our asana practice. So it still includes making the sound with the breath. Make that soft sound. We're going to change the rhythm so that the exhale becomes double the inhale. So you can try a couple like this first. So inhaling the normal count that you've been doing and trying to extend the exhale so that it becomes double. Everybody exhale together and then inhale. At the end of the inhale, you're going to use your thumb to close the right nostril and exhale only through the left nostril. Double. Remove the thumb. Inhale through both nostrils. Close the right nostril, exhale through the left, double. Inhale through 
to both nostrils. Close the right, exhale left, double. Continuing at your own breathing rhythm, see if you can do 12 more rounds. So always inhale through both nostrils and exhale only through the left.
Place the hands on the, on the legs in a way that the arms and shoulders can relax, allowing the legs to take the weight of the arms. The breathing technique is said to reduce negativity. It's a cooling breath. Place the hands together. Rub the hands together, warming up the palms. And then bring the palms over the eyes. Opening the eyes behind the palms. And then slowly releasing them. So, the topic tonight is fear. <laughs> Anybody experiencing some fear lately? Admit it? No, maybe a little bit. So, yeah. Anybody, you can go like this or put your, uh, put your um, sound on and say if you want to say something. Well, I think that's probably pretty normal. And in fact, if you're not experiencing fear, then maybe you need to look a little bit deeper <laughs> because I'm sure it's there somewhere. <laughs> um, there is something in the Yoga Sutras called the Kleshas. There's five, they say there's five Kleshas. Patanjali says there's five Kleshas. And these are afflictions that affect everybody, every single one of us. They even say that the whys are affected by these kleshas. So they're at the core of us, we could say. So the first klesha is called avidya. And avidya, what it means is ignorance. So we're not talking about ignorance that I can't uh, speak French very well, or, you know, I don't know the capital country of certain countries. It's not this kind of ignorance. It's the ignorance that we, we see this as the reality. Our body, our emotions, um, our thoughts, the world around us, that we see this as the ultimate reality rather than the true self, the deep self, the divine as the ultimate reality. So this is the kind of ignorance. It's a spiritual ignorance. Um, so we see the world through our ego as mita. This is the second klesha. So we see the world through this container, right? So the ego is the, it's our personality, it's our thoughts, and we also say our, we have our bo body, so it's our mind, body, ego. We see the world through this container. Um, and then because of this, because we see ourselves as this ego, then we experience attachment to things because that ego, it sees things around us because of our, our five senses. Um, it sees the things that we're attracted to and we want to go after them and we want to claim them. We want to hold on to them. We want to experience them. We want to have pleasure. And then also there's aversion, dwesha. There's things around us that we um, do not want to experience. We have aversion to them. So things that are going to cause us fear, for example, things that will cause us illness, things that um, bring displeasure instead of pleasure. Okay, does that make sense so far? So we, we don't see ourselves as our real, real divine self. So we identify with our ego and our body ego. So we identify with that and then we want to find the things that give that pleasure and we want to go away from the things that um, give it pain or suffering, right? 
And then all this is caused because we have a binidesha, which means, you know, there's different translations for it, but it means um, the will to live or a clinging to life, which is also a sense of fear, right? So we experience fear because this organism wants to stay alive. Okay, so there's something positive about this, right? Do you, can you see that? Because we, our body wants to stay connected to the world around us. So it wants to stay alive. It's in our DNA to stay alive, right? Usually we're not chasing after death unless there's um, mental instability, right? So um, we could also see those five kleshas working in the opposite direction. So we could say that because we have fear, we experience aversion. Because I have fear, I don't want to get a disease. Because I have fear, I don't want to walk in the middle of the street and be hit by a car. Um, and because I have fear, I'm attached to things that are going to nourish this body. So I'm attached to feeding the body. I'm attached to you know, drinking water. I'm attached to being able to sleep. I'm also attached to others because others bring me um, attachment and uh, company and positive feelings, right? And then I, because I'm attached to all this, I see myself as separate from the others, right? Because when I'm talking about that we're attached to others, we're attached from a superficial place. I'm attached to others that bring me pleasure and I avert those who don't bring me pleasure. Does that make sense so far? Yes? No? <laughs> um, so we see ourselves as separate from the world around us and from each other. So this is ego, right? And when we talk about ego from the philo philosophical sense, it's not like the way we use ego in common language. Oh, she has such a huge ego. There's something wrong with her because she has a big ego. It's not this. It's just really from a point of um, the ego is, right? end of story, right? It's not good, bad, we're not adding any judgment to that. It just, it's part of the circle of life. These five kleshas, we all have it, we all have an ego. And if I don't have an ego, I'm not gonna be able to say, hi, I'm Linda, I'm gonna teach about yoga, right? I wouldn't have the ability to say that if I have zero ego, right? That is part of my ego. And because of this ego, we misperceive the true nature of things, the true nature of this world, the true nature of this universe. Okay, so within that, you can start to see what, where the teachings will lead us, right? What does it lead us to? It leads us to wanting to see the true nature. Right? to experience the true, true nature, nature, to understand what the true nature is. I don't think personally that it's killing of the ego. Okay? I think it's more of an integration of the ego, integrating who I am in this body, in my life, in with all the true natures of everybody else, and that is at the core of this universe. Does that make sense? So it's not necessarily about um, complete um, a killing sense. This sounds too, it's a kind of on a negative, it's a negative way of putting it in my personal belief. Um, so something positive about all that is it's universal. Somehow that gives you some, whew, okay, it's not just me that's freaking out here, right? <laughs> everybody is freaking out there so it gives us this sense already that gives us the sense of being one no can you recognize that 
it's not only me that's uh, having a nervous breakdown about whatever you know we're all experiencing this if not right now at some point in our life we have experienced it or we will experience it so then we can feel that connection with all the other human beings on that planet and animals and beings and plants and everything um, also, we could say that we are supposed to have fear, right? Because this organism wants to survive. It wants to survive, so it needs to have the DNA set in to jump out of the way if something dangerous is coming at it. It needs to learn to protect itself. It's going to protect itself. So this is a positive thing. Um, that's why we have a nervous system, right? The problem is that nervous system kind of goes off and takes over. So we'll get in, yeah, well that was actually my next note. I even forgot what I wrote there. So the problem is it gets triggered and then it gets stuck in those places. Oh my God, what am I going to do? How can I handle this? I have no idea what to do. And then the, the fight, flight, freeze comes in and we don't know how to get out of that, right? And so then it's like you push the button and the button is stuck and I don't know how to release that button. You're shaking the computer, like what's going on here, right? So then when that happens, it controls us. Right? So we have no sense of feeling like there's a certain amount of control there. And when it controls of us, we actually react by maybe over-controlling, right? We react by controlling back. And we react in, we, yeah, we react in some other ways, which we'll get to. So therefore, what we want to do is we want to transform the way that we relate with our fear. Okay? Rather than denying our fear, we just want to relate with it in a more skillful manner. That makes sense? Tell me, like if I'm over talking, just like, Linda, I need to say something. <laughs> okay, and you can step in. Okay, okay, <laughs> good. So, um, yeah, we want to relate with our fear and not think of it as something bad, right? Do most of you feel like, oh my God, I'm so scared of this. There's something wrong with me. Has anybody experienced this? Especially in, in yoga asana, no? Right, oh, she wants me to do a headstand. I'm so scared of a headstand. How come everybody else is doing the headstand? How come I can't do it? There must be something wrong with me, right? Oh, I'm supposed to face my fear. So I'm supposed to cut through it and just force myself through that fear. Right? I'm going to do it no matter what. I don't think that's really the right, the right uh, way to. That's trying to take control of the fear rather than embrace the fear and understand it and nurture it. So, some triggered. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Yeah, how do we do that? Yeah, that's what we're going to come to. <laughs> so, um, some triggers. Some things that are triggering our fear to try to understand a little bit um, why we get that, you know, we push the trigger button and it gets stuck and we can't unstick it. So at the core of it, we fear change. Okay, Prakriti, which is the, which is nature. It's the world, we are nature, you know. There's a part of us that is Purusha, that is the self, but we are also composed of nature. So this is, its natural aspect is to change. Your body is changing every day. The world around us is changing every day. Things are growing, things are dying. We build a house, the house deteriorates. We have to fix some things, we have to change some things. We might take down a house and put in a new house. All this kind of stuff is constantly changing. So we have that fear of change. We also have fear, because of that fear of change, we have the fear of our health. And so right now, this is a big one. A lot of people are very fearful of 
catching this virus or having people we love catch this virus or even people that we don't know, just the fear of uh, many people catching this virus. So that's a trigger, is our fear of our health. Um, fear of losing our social life. Like, look how we're socializing. You know, it's so strange. It's a change. And this is very hard to get used to. I'm sorry, I feel like, you know, this week feels a little bit better than last week because last week I felt like I was kind of sweating behind my head because I was like, this feels just so weird to be talking to people that are just little squares on a computer screen. Um, so we fear that loss of our social life. Will it come back? Will we be able to all go and hang out together one day? When will that be? We know it will happen one day, but when will that happen and how will it happen? Will we go up to each other and give each other a hug or are we going to feel like, oh my God, maybe I shouldn't do that anymore, right? This is a big question. Um, I think we need to. We need to have that physical contact again. We need to eventually allow ourselves to let go of that fear of being close to one another. But that's another topic. Um, the fear of losing this freedom to move around. We've been so used to being able to buy a train ticket, buy an airline ticket, and take off wherever we want to. How long is that going to last where we're not allowed to travel about as we want to? We're not allowed to take the dog for a walk more than a kilometer from our home, right? It's a little bit strange and I think it sets, it settles in deep inside in our body in a little bit of a fearful manner. We might not be conscious of it, but just these big changes to our life will settle it's itself into different places of our body. Um, our jobs. So if you're an employee for a company, maybe you might be fearing that the company is going to have financial problems and you might just completely lose your job at the end of this. If you're a business owner like I am, I am totally, I've been experiencing fear up and down. Oh my God, maybe it's been like 18 years I've been teaching yoga. Maybe I'm not going to be able to teach anymore. Are we going to ever be able to bring a whole bunch of people in the same room and do Ashtanga yoga and touch each other and sweat? And maybe this will change forever. Um, maybe the business will have to close, right? All these kinds of things are wavering through me. Um, and I know I've talked to other business owners like across the street, a woman who has a small business. Um, it's not just us that experience this. Hairdressers, little shops, um, I don't know, whatever businesses there are out there, dry cleaners, everyone's experiencing this. So, which leads to our financial stability. We've been used to living, we've been spoiled, I'm sorry, but uh, our generations, whether you're, you know, some of you are like in your 20s, some of you are in your 50s, our generations, none of us have really experienced severe financial problems as a whole, as a, um, as a country, right? We have recessions in and out, you know, sometimes we have better financial situations than other times, but what, when we're reading the, the news, Right now, we're, they're projecting that we're gonna have um, a financial disaster like the Great Depression, which is all, we've only heard about it in textbooks, right? Or from our grandparents, things like this. So there's, that's a trigger. And then lastly, I want to say is anticipation. <laughs> Everything I just listed is all about anticipating what will come, right? Who knows? Maybe in three months, it's all over. Boom, everybody comes back to normal. And it's just like a little blip in time that a few years from now we forget, right? So, or we tell our grandchildren about the big corona, you know, COVID-19, right? We don't know. So we're anticipating a lot about what is coming. And then this is creating a lot of fear in us. So, Oh yeah, this is a great quote by Mark Twain. The worst things in my life never happened. 
They're trying to bring this back, back to, you know, back to the heart center, back to the true self. Okay, I'm getting myself all worked up and I don't even know if that's gonna happen. I'm not saying don't prepare for the future, don't be smart, don't, you know, protect ourselves, protect our world. Um, not saying to do not to do those kinds of things, but doing them from a place of stability, a place of facing what is actually happening, facing what is happening in my body, in my emotions, in my mental stability. So what to do? That was the question. So face our fears, face them, really see them. What are they? And make friends with them. Don't make them the enemy. Don't try to cover them up. Don't try to push them away, right? Don't numb out. Don't use substances to numb out. And, um, you know, we all, we think automatically of drugs, but any kind of substance, whether it's, um, you know, cigarettes, alcohol, um, uh, overconsumption of movies, overconsumption of novels, overconsumption of the news. This is my big thing right now is I, I know I have to tear myself away from that news. And every time I'm like, okay, just going to look a little bit more. What's going on here? Oh my God. Oh my God. This is happening. Oh no, I should be putting it away. I'm over consuming the news. So I'm working on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, yeah, and so normally we're trying to, I said this earlier, normally when we experience fear, we're trying to control it somehow. Like if I do these steps, then I'm not going to have to experience this, 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 right? So rather than actually feeling it, first we have to feel it. And I think we need to feel it fully. This goes a lot of counter to some of the advice out there. Um, I don't believe in just like pushing yourself through the fear and, uh, you know, bullying yourself through fear. I believe in softening with the fear, really experiencing it. If you need to cry, you cry. You can take a day to hibernate and just eat everything you want to eat, watch anything you want to watch, cry as many tears you want to cry. You don't want to get stuck in it, but sometimes we just need to do this just to kind of release it all. Does that make sense? Yeah? Um, because unfaced fear, it becomes toxic. Okay, if we don't face it, then it becomes something, something toxic in our life. Because then that's when we use substances or controlling patterns or blame or different ways of um, trying to hide our fear, to not want to recognize it. We all, we all do this in some, you know, emotionally or mentally somehow. So, and then that happens, when this happens, we also use it against each other. Don't you see it in the politics? That's why I'm addicted to it. Actually, it's a soap opera, you know, on some level. It's just like, it's not my fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. No, it's their fault. It's just like blaming everybody isn't going to take care of the situation, right? We can, we can worry about that later, maybe in how to figure out how not to have this happen again. But really what we need to do right now is take care of the situation. Whoever's fault it is, uh, you know, we're all going to have different opinions as to who's a, whose fault it is. So it's not working collectively when we're just blaming each other. So we turn, we use it to turn against each other. And this can turn out to be using blame, anger, tension, worry, anxiety, stress, depression, all these kinds of things is um, like how fear um, expresses itself. Anything else that it, any other ways you can think how it expresses itself? That's all I could think of, but I'm sure there's millions of others. So also on the, so what to do. 
So there's this teacher, he's passed away since um, many years, I think the 90s, Joseph Campbell. Have you heard of Joseph Campbell? Some of you? He's pretty, yeah, he's pretty cool. Um, so he describes, he takes, if you imagine you have a big circle and then he draws the line, uh, this, a line through the circle. And he shows that the below the line is our unconscious. Above the line is our conscious. So our conscious behavior, our conscious thoughts, below is our unconscious behavior, our unconscious thoughts and feelings, emotions, anything like this. So he said that most of fear is resting in the unconscious. So it's all stuck under there. So again, it goes back to then we live our life from a place of unconscious fear instead of recognizing it. So what we want to do is we want to try to bring that unconscious fear into the conscious aspect. So above that line. So, yeah, so in our, did I say unconscious? <laughs> Sorry, into our conscious. It's my unconscious working, right? So I want to bring it into my consciousness so that I can see it. If I can see it, then maybe I have a chance of working with it in, an, in a skillful, intelligent manner, right? Does that make sense? Um, so we want to see where it rests. So where does fear rest? So fear is resting in the physical body, right? It's resting in our body, in our body posture. So we can see it when we get fearful. What do we do, right? This is the, yeah, this is the typical fear way of expressing our fear. And it doesn't happen overnight. It happens slowly, slowly, slowly over time. We experience fear when we're young. And I see it with teenagers. You know, like I would say from 10 years old and up that young people start to get this pattern. And if you investigate into our own years of those during those times or our children or our nieces and nephews we see that when children were young um, they're very open and wanting to experience a lot they're less likely to be overly shy and then slowly slowly when they enter these teenage years they start to separate you know, like kids, when they're very young, they play as big groups and then they start to separate it into this is my group, that's your group, and you can't be a part of my group. And they start to feel more self-conscious about answering questions when the teachers are asking. They feel more self-conscious about their bodies, more self-conscious with uh, their parents and the world around them. And so I think a lot of it is starting in those years. And then we, you, you see them. They're in this pattern. That's why I'm always telling my kids, sit up straight, sit up straight, sit up straight. Because our fears start to mold themselves in our body. And so this is why we do yoga asana, is to connect with our body and find how we're expressing our emotions in our physical body. Right? Does, does that make sense? So, so we change our posture depending on how we feel, right? And I'm checking the time because I think I'm over time already. Um, and then, so this is, so in the, the yoga philosophy, we have these pancha koshas. There's five koshas. So the, the outermost kosha is the physical body, okay? It's the anamaya kosha. So it's our food and drink body. And then the next kosha, next layer, it's called the pranamaya kosha. It's our breath body. So when we are constantly in this kind of position of our fearful body, 
then you can see that it's going to put some pressure here pressure on the heart pressure on the lungs and this is going to affect our breathing it's going to be harder to breathe fully breathe freely when we're stuck in these you know shoulders up towards the ears compressed chest right so you can see how they work together those two layers of the body and then we we find ourselves in shallow breathing right when our central nervous system does this for us when we are in a great like when something really happens very suddenly to us then it changes our breath right it gives us the adrenaline it makes us want to run right so if this is always triggered then we're going to be constantly changing the way we are breathing shallow breathing very quick breathing these kinds of things um, and then we go into the third layer of our our body which becomes a little bit more subtle which is the mind body manomaya kosha which is where our our thoughts and our emotions are held and so you can start to see how these are starting to link together. I've been sitting in a fearful position. I'm having trouble breathing. And I'm not saying they layer because it could start with the thoughts, right? I'm not suggesting that they're, they're um, working in a specific order. They work in all different orders. So then I have these fearful thoughts, these critical thoughts, these judgmental thoughts, um, you know, all these kind of neg what we would call negative thought patterns and negative feelings. Then it creates the feelings of um, depression, unworthiness, um, even pride would be in there because if I feel better than somebody, that means that I'm not connected. I'm not connected with the inner self because if I am truly connected with my inner self, then I don't need to feel pride that I'm better than anybody else, right? Because I'm one with everybody else. I'm one with that peace, that little, you know, true heart nature in all the others. Um, and then some of the thoughts would be, I'm alone. Like I feel alone. I feel numb. I lose my sensitivity, right? So it can give you some compassion because sometimes we can see that there's people around us that don't seem to have a sensitivity. They don't experience empathy. They don't have compassion. It's all me, 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 pride, pride, pride. I'm the best. I'm going to, I'm going to actually profit from this uh, whole world catastrophe, right? So those are from a state of fear. Right? It's a state of not being connected. So it's actually, we can feel some sadness for that, right? Some compassion for those who are uh, behaving this way in the world. Then we go into, it doesn't relate to um, fear because then there's the intellect body, the knowledge body, you know, these are higher states. And so when we get into those states, then this is where we're going to feel connected. The um, Anandamaya Kosha, where it's the self, it's the bliss body. So when we can work and dig through all that, we start to experience those parts of our body, which will help to, um, because they're layers, it's like layers of an onion. And so if we're affecting those layers, they will affect our posture. They will affect our breathing. They will affect our thought patterns, our emotional body, right? So it kind of goes back to, so, oh yeah, I want to talk about this um, Harlow's attachment theory. So there's this psychologist that um, did some uh, research on monkeys and they took these monkeys away, it's, it's cruel, <laughs> you know, it's, nowadays it wouldn't be allowed to do these, um, these experiments because they're unethical, but it did teach us something, so we can at least profit from the, the teaching. So um, they took baby monkeys away from their parents at birth, and they put them, I'm simplifying it, but they put them in different um, 
atmospheres or environments. So some monkeys were given an environment <clears throat> where they had a fake mommy monkey that had um, soft tissues on it and it fed them. So that fake monkey body would give them uh, texture, warmth, comfort, plus food. And then they had other monkeys that were put in a cage with two separate mommy monkeys. So one was just a caged monkey, like a metal wire monkey that had a bottle to feed the baby monkeys. And then the other was the, the warm, comforting, soft tissue monkey, mommy monkey. And they saw that the monkeys um, that lost affection so and then uh, maybe I'm getting something wrong and then yeah the monkeys that lost so those monkeys that had the food and the affection separate they would go to the food mommy monkey just to eat and then they would go back and they would cling to the soft tissue monkey so what they noticed is that over time, there was many other experiments, what they noticed is that monkeys who did not have the soft tissue monkey, they were only being fed, they, they went crazy. They, they lost every sense of um, uh, sanity. So in other words, you can die if you don't have attachment. So they use this to prove that babies need attachment. And it goes on to some other experiments. Tally, you must know all about that, right? <laughs> um, goes into other experiments that show that babies who don't, they can be fed, but if they don't get this attachment, they do not grow up feeling love. They don't, um, what's the word? They don't, um, they don't grow up being healthy on all different levels. So this is something I've been thinking about because of this uh, social distancing and how it is affecting us mentally and emotionally and the mental distress that there must be happening in a lot of people. <clears throat> the fear and mental distress because we're missing this um, comfort from each other. Because a screen is nice, but it's kind of like the wire monkey baby right? I mean, why are monkey mama, mommy, right? So what to do? So I, uh, Amaya, my daughter actually found this online and there was no um, author to it, but fear, F-E-A-R. It can be forget everything and run, right? Or it can be face everything and rise. The choice is yours. I found that amazing. <laughs> um, so this is what we have to do. We have to face everything and rise. Do you want me to say it again? Forget, e yeah. The first one was forget everything and run. Forget everything and rise. Rise, like rise with it, above it. Um, another one that I like is from, from Tara Brock. She teaches this, um, she uses this acronym called RAIN, R-A-I-N. And it is recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture. So I highly recommend any of her podcasts. She has like hundreds of them. And I usually listen to her every evening and every morning, just like 10, 15 minutes. So recognize, so first, Tara Brock, T-A-R-A, -A, Brock, B-R-A-C-H. So first we have to recognize our fears and recognize them in our body, in our tissues, in our breath, in our emotions, in our thoughts. Recognize it on all different levels and allow it, allow them to be there. Don't push them away, don't blame them don't judge them they're okay they're universal they're there to protect us and then to investigate them 
and investigate them not on from a mental place but from a heart centered place right from the heart finding your who you are who's your true self and then nurture so nurture whatever is happening there so this is why i started doing the sunday evening you know self nourishing nourishing yoga right because i think we need this we need this now but i think we always need it i'm going to continue that because i think that um, the ashtanga yoga practice is amazing but it might not be what we need all the time sometimes we just need to nourish ourselves do a little bit of breathing do a little bit of sitting do some easy movements that we don't judge ourselves because face it we are, we're always judging ourselves with Ashtanga Yoga, no? Oh, today's not as good of a practice as yesterday. If I keep doing this, will I be able to do that pose? So we need to balance that out a little bit. So, and I think there's this practice of offering it up. I have a little sticky note on my computer so that when I feel something that I, you know, that feels like a negative experience, I need to offer it, offer it to, you know, offer it up to God, the divine, and just like this is also part of my learning, right? Let it, I, I experience it, and then I offer it away. Let it be a path to serve us, a ser serve us for our enlightenment, our mini enlightenments on, on that path. And it doesn't mean that you don't act, but it helps it be less personal. Because when we take it personally, then we feel alone. It creates more detachment, more separation from each other. Makes us feel embarrassed. We experience things like embarrassment and, um, and then we can't act uh, from a place of fearlessness. Okay? We want to act from that place, from our heart center. Because our heart, it's it doesn't have fear. Our true self doesn't experience fear. It is pure. It is always, it knows it's a higher knowledge than us. It knows that despite everything that is going on, it will always be okay. It is exactly what is needed. So we're going to do a quick meditation because I went way over time, but I didn't know what to cut out from my little talk there. Um, if you need to leave for some reason, I will not take it. I will not be offended by it. You can um, watch this later and do the meditation with us later. So you're going to close your eyes. You can readjust yourself so you feel comfortable. Elongate the spine. And tune in with the breath. Tune in with the body. Noticing the vibration in the body. Notice the rhythm of the breath. body and the breath begin to settle, the mind, the thoughts, the emotions begin to settle. you can sense the, the subtlety of the mind. Just 
It's not the thoughts. It's not the emotions even. Something deeper and more subtle than this. Like you can barely grasp it. But somehow you you know it's there. Your intuition tells you it's there. You can bring yourself to your heart center. And see if you can notice that there's a, a sense of something deeper. you that you normally identify with. It's not the body. It's not the mind. It's not the thoughts or the emotions. always there. You might experience as, it as that essence of yourself. That essence that is there when you are 20 years old. there when you were 15. You look very different. You think very different. You feel different. There's this essence that's exactly the same. It was there when you were 10 years old. Old. It's not the same. It's hard to grasp onto that you sense that it's there. It's there when you were just a small baby. there before you were even
everything you can see. will be forever. Even as this body essentially dissolves away, that essence will remain. into the in the world around you. Face our fears, face the world. In a place of equanimity, a place of love, a place of compassion. Take the time a few times a day to just close your eyes no matter where you are. Remain still. And make that connection. your true strength, true power. To go through whatever you need to go through. share this with everyone, all beings, all over, everywhere. Let's chant Om Shanti together. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti.
Thank you. I hope it helps and share it with everybody. Nice to see you all. <laughs> Have a good evening. Okay. Bye bye. Let me know if it works, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye.